Hello everyone. Welcome to Mystifyingly Missing. My name is Rhonda Franny Jefferson and before I get into the episode today I would like to just discuss the channel for a moment. Now personally I love exploring a number of different topics and I think there's so much that we can learn from in history, in current you know, circumstances, just you know really a lot that we can you know, absorb and learn and grow from. So what I'd like to do is expand the scope of this podcast. While yes, a lot of the focus will still remain on missing persons, there are other things that have happened in history um, or even in more current events that I think need to be explored. So I'll be just expanding the scope of the topics that um, we'll be covering I will keep the um, title mystifyingly missing and then once I narrow down um, some other specific topics I will go ahead and add that to the title. If you already you know are subscribed or listened to the podcast you will be able to find it you know in the same way and you know again I will keep mystifyingly missing in front but then add another topic or two just to you know expand on what we'll be discussing so speaking of subscribing um, just if you do enjoy you know the topic that I do cover currently or sound where it sounds like you may be interested in also the additional topics please make sure to subscribe and I also have a YouTube channel where usually it's the um, audio from the podcast that's uploaded but if there's any visual material that can be added I do add that as well so you can head over there I'll have the link in the description but what that does is it helps the algorithm that either the podcast platform or YouTube uses to help people find um, channels that they are interested in so any subscriptions likes or comments um, you know depending on what the app you're on will allow you to do does really help the channel grow. So today's case will actually leave I think everybody a little stumped if not a lot stumped. This is titled The Locked Plane Mystery. I think we've all heard of the locked room mysteries but this just might take things to a whole new level. So with that being said let's get into it. So imagine you're a private pilot entrusted with the safe travel of a very important and successful man. He has his own plane customized to his exacting specifications. There's pressure but you're an adrenaline junkie maybe even before that term was known. You love flying and would do it even if you didn't get paid for it. But hey flying a state-of-the-art plane traveling across the world as your boss and his team make meetings make deals to basically make more money and as long as he's making money you're making money so you whistle as you take off and see the beautiful clear sky on that fine july day you're flying over the english channel on your way back home to the continent but then the door to the cockpit opens you're told some unbelievable news. He's missing. He's gone. A man that was on the plane is now gone. He's nowhere on the plane. The third richest man on earth is missing. Again from a plane and you're in the air so your mind can barely process what you're hearing. You know you have to find a place to set the plane down. Or should you? You know, things will need to be handled delicately. The press will definitely soon be all over this story, or as quickly as they could in 1928. But you take a deep breath and know it's time to make some important decisions. Alfred Lowenstein was a man larger than life, yet he may be one of the richest men that you've never heard of. And the fact that he went missing from a plane would have at least in my opinion, made his story as well known as Amelia Earhart's. Now, Alfred made some money here and he was not afraid to show it. 
and he wasn't afraid to use it to make even more money. Hence, owning this plane at a time where there really was not a lot of private aviation that was being used for business purposes, or really just a lot of aviation in general. You know, really, flying was still in its infancy, so in some ways he was really cornering that market. He probably had an advantage among some of his business rivals because he did have the plane, being able to make those meetings where others could not, where you know the trains of the rails and the ships on the water just could not keep up with flying. So he really used that to his advantage to make more money. So... Much is still being learned about flight during this time, but, you know, he needed to get where he needed to get to. So he had actually been nicknamed the Belgian Crasis. Now, Crasis was an ancient Lydian king who had immense wealth also. He was the first ruler to make a standardized purity for gold that would be used in coins. Hence, he probably increased the wealth of the honest man by allowing there to actually be the correct amount of gold in a coin, while decreasing the prospective wealth of would-be cons, who would add fillers and gold that was not quite so pure into the coins. So, Lowenstein, again, had some money. He was born in Belgium in March of 1877. His father was a German-Jewish banker who was living in Brussels, Belgium at the time of Alfred's birth. Now, Alfred himself went on to establish his own businesses, undoubtedly using information that he gleaned from his father. Now, at a time when the Belgian economy was in turmoil, Lowenstein was so wealthy that he even offered the government an interest-free loan of $50 million, again, without interest. But he wasn't doing this solely from the goodness of his own heart. He wanted the rights to print the Belgian currency, but the government declined the offer. But the drive and tenacity that Lowenstein had worked to his advantage in investing in the growth of electric energy, building electric plants in countries that were still developing, and he also invested in artificial silk, which apparently was a bigger commodity than I thought it was. Now, you also don't get to be the third richest man in the world without making some enemies, through both legitimate and illegitimate means. An investment that he had solicited funds for failed to launch, but his investors wanted their money back, and not just the capital that they had originally invested. Now, you know, we could say, as some have, have described this as almost like a pyramid scheme, in some of the descriptions that I've read, but it does seem as though this was an investment that he was legitimately trying to make. It's just things fell through as they sometimes do. And then he started to make decisions that were not, you know, very proper to make in business. But he was rumored though to be trying to make some money through some not so legitimate means. And again, I have to emphasize the word rumored. That rumor was that he was involved in illegal drugs. So if this was true, it could theoretically be the first time that drugs were smuggled on a plane. Now, again, we have to emphasize it was a rumor, and we don't even know if the deal ever really came to fruition because this was supposed to have happened very shortly before his disappearance. Now, with that disappearance, though, people began to panic. A lot of people held stock in his companies, and now with an unsure future, the worth of those stocks were really in question and started to drop, and people then started to get rid of them. So, I did Google this next question, but at least using the search engine I did, or the combination of terms, I didn't find any info, but I wondered, could the vanishing of the third richest man in the world in 1928, a man who had holdings in multiple countries, could that have led to the Great Depression that began in 1929, just one year later? 
it's just a thought, but the dates just were so close to each other. And the fact that this extremely rich man had disappeared and his stock started to take a fall, it, it was just something that I find curious and would be interested in hearing your thoughts on. So now we do have a little bit of history of this very successful man. And, you know, again, he was flying all over the world, just as he normally did, because this was normal for him. But that was his normal life up until July 4th, 1928. Now, he would be flying from England to Brussels, Belgium. He had a Fokker F V11A3 trimotor. Lowenstein usually traveled with some core people with him to assist him both once he got to the location he was traveling to, as well as to multitask in the air. He was one of the original air commuters and he was very, very familiar with flying. And again, this plane was to his specifications. Now, besides Lowenstein, there were six other people on the plane. We have the pilot, Donald Drew. A mechanic was on board sitting in the cockpit, Robert Little. His valet, Fred Baxter, was also on board along with two stenographers, Eileen Clark and Paula Bedallion. And the last person to ran, round out his employees was Arthur Hodgson, his secretary. Now the flight path would take him over the English Channel at an elevation of about 4,000 feet. They left early in the evening around 6.30 or 6.45 and according to all reports the weather was good with clear skies. Now the plane had been again built to his specifications and there was a cockpit of course at the front of the plane then the passenger cabin and at the back there was a door that then led to two different doors. Now once the door was opened it revealed a door to the laboratory, what we would call the bathroom, and also a door that was the entrance and exit. So the bathroom was on the right side of the plane but since he was walking back once he got to those the door and opened the one that led from the cabin to the other two doors, he would find that the bathroom would be on his left. Now the entrance and exit was on the left side of the plane. Now again, since he's walking back to approach that door, once he got past the cabin door, he would turn right. I did find a sketch of how the plane was laid out. So I will include the link in the description of the podcast along with um, the links of any of my sources as well as if you are watching through the YouTube channel I will have it up on the screen. If you are listening through the YouTube channel then just to let you know I may be typing over some of the wording on the graph because it's very old and in some places very hard to read so I just want to make sure all the wording is clear. Now, during this flight, Alfred had started out just spending time working like he normally did, but at some point he did need to excuse himself to use the lavatory. Now, no one really looked at their watch or checked the time. There really wasn't a reason to do so. Now, this will affect the timeline since we don't really have an exact one to go by. But as far as the witnesses and what they would estimate, I don't think they could really be too far off on the timeline. So once he left, his employees sat back on the flight for a while, but the minutes did begin to pass, then a few more minutes, until about 10 minutes or so had passed since their boss had walked to the back of the plane. Now, I'm just going to add personally, I don't think 10 minutes is an extremely long amount of time to be concerned. You know, it could be anything from a personal issue or him just needing to take a moment away from everybody. But 10 minutes, at least to me, seemed a little bit of a short time. And even though that's in my opinion on it, um, his valet, Fred Baxter, was becoming concerned 
Thinking that his boss was ill, he began to walk towards the back of the plane, never imagining that he would see what he did. As he stepped through the door at the back of the plane, he could never have imagined that the entrance exit door was open. It was in the description of his employee of the employees flapping in the wind. Now, I can only imagine that it would take a couple of moments just to really take in the scene. They were in a plane 4,000 feet in the air. What happened? Did he fall, trip against the door, and it opened? If he did, then definitely there was something wrong with that door. Did he accidentally choose the wrong door to open and stepped out into nothingness? But really, Baxter had no time to figure out how it happened, but he knew it had happened. The third richest man in the world seemingly had fallen off the face of the earth. But Baxter made his way to the pilot, Donald Drew. Drew decided to make an emergency landing, choosing to sit down on a beach. Now this beach was in Dunkirk, France, and was run by the French military. So needless to say, they were not really happy about having a plane land on their beach. And needless to say, the occupants were questioned rather intensely. Now, this, of course, could have been avoided if Drew had decided to land at an available airstrip in St. Ingelbert. So, I'm reading this and learning about, you know, where exactly everything was located, and I'm thinking, beach, airstrip. You know, you're, you're flying and you have to make this decision of a beach or an airstrip. You could land at a place that is equipped to deal with planes, will have communication devices and you can get the word out to searchers quickly. Or you could land on a place where you have no idea what type of resources may be available, um, what type of communication systems they may have access to, but yep, you decided to land on the second one. So all the employees were grilled by both the military and then later an, an investigator. And, you know, you really just don't land on a military base, no matter how inviting it looks, and don't expect to be grilled. But everybody really had the same story. They said that he must have opened the wrong door and walked away into his fate. But it took a while to even get to that point. They didn't want to give out any information at first, especially the pilot, Drew. A detective was confused by both the case itself and the employees attempt to evade providing answers. You know, the investigators too would have to kind of bulk up on their learning about planes as that was the primary location of the crime if there was one, or at least where the investigation needed to begin. There was also some difficulty too because where he could have theoretically went missing was international waters, so that just not to use a pun here, but muddies the water a little bit more. As with any incident where a person may have ended up in the water, one of the first things that investigators and searchers will start to do is drag that body of water. But going into this, I never would have thought that they would have tried to drag the English Channel, but they did. The English Channel is about 350 miles long and can be around 150 miles across. So this really would have been a staggering feat. But by the time Baxter had found that Lowenstein was gone, we don't really know how many minutes might have passed. If he had fallen almost as soon as he made it to the back of the plane, then he would have fallen you know, 10 minutes earlier approximately than when Baxter made the discovery. Even though the planes at that time did not fly quite as fast as they do today, there still would have been quite a distance that was traveled in that time period. Now, pretty much immediately, searchers considered this a recovery, not a rescue. They really could not have expected anyone to fall that 4,000 feet and survive. However, what I found interesting was there was at least one newspaper, the New York Times, so pretty, you know, pretty big newspaper, started to say that he had drowned. 
Now, it made me take pause because I'm thinking if you're hitting the water at 4,000 feet, I would think that would almost be an instantaneous death. You know, it's not a soft landing. It would almost be like impacting concrete. So, you know, to say that he had drowned so soon after the event had actually occurred, you know, within one day, I think that was kind of, you know, jumping the gun and you know, just speculating probably to sell more copies to make it seem like you had an inside scoop. Just my opinion as well. Now, I've noticed in some missing persons cases that there can be an extensive search for an extended period of time and there's no trace of the individual ever found. And that can go on for weeks, but then it seems almost as soon as the search is ended that the body is found by a hiker or a dog walker, construction worker. Well, about the same thing happened here. In the waters off of Calais, France, which was close to where they had made the landing, his body was found by fishermen. Now, since it was found close to where they had made the emergency landing, you could assume then that he had fallen much closer to the time that Baxter found that he was missing. So instead of that full 10 minutes, it would have been you know, closer to just a couple of minutes. Now, because it had been over two weeks before his body had been located, Lowenstein's remains were not in good condition, but the body was wearing Lowenstein's clothes. So, I mean, it had to be him, right? Well, it was soon revealed that the body had suffered a skull fracture. And it was speculated that it may not have killed him outright, so he still could have been alive when he hit the water. This is where I'm going to interject my opinion again, because I really didn't know how to react to these statements that were being made. Because, you know, again, 4,000 feet. I really don't see how anybody could stay conscious, much less stay alive. I mean, yes, there have been, you know, rare cases of people falling where the parachute didn't open or in an accident where they did survive, but it's highly unusual. And so in this case, I would assume because of just the impact that he would have died almost instantaneously. Now, the autopsy pointed out that there was an odd, you know, odd thing showing up there where he had alcohol in his system, yet he was known to never drink. He did not drink at all. So two things about this is first, the body can actually produce alcohol as part of the decomposition process. So without access to the exact levels that he had or comparison to how much you would expect to see in two weeks of decomposition at sea, we just don't really know where that alcohol came from. The second thing is it says that the only odd thing was the alcohol in his system, but I'm thinking with no mention of broken bones that that's also highly unusual. You would think, again, after falling 4,000 feet, that you would have more than a skull fracture. A skull fracture is bad enough, but at that impact, you know, I would have thought that there would be broken ribs, broken arms, legs, just a lot of extensive broken bones, as well as possible damage to internal organs or internal bleeding, just because of the sheer impact of the force. But this was what was reported you know, in his autopsy. So now the investigators had the body. And usually once you find a body in a missing persons investigation, it really gives that investigation a push. And with, the, again, the third richest man being the source of that investigation, you would think that no stone would be left unturned. But that may not have been the case. Now, while there was the investigation, I think that looking at it from today's perspective, the investigation really would not be up to par with what we would expect today. But here is some other information that the investigators found. Now, the British Air Ministry did look into this and they ran a test using the same plane that Lowenstein was traveling in. 
Now, one of the brave agents actually ran at the door while it was flying at 1,000 feet. And remember, Alfred's plane was flying at 4,000 feet when he went missing. But when the investigator hit the door, it did crack open at about six inches. But almost immediately, the force from the air on the outside of the plane caused the door to close again. So the conclusion was that he could not have walked out of that door. You know, he couldn't even probably have run out that door um, since, you know, it would have, would have actually come back and closed itself very, very quickly. So given this, the test did seem to disprove two theories, one of an accident and one that he killed himself. So I also on a side note, really hope that that investigator who ran at the door was very securely tethered to something in the cabin. Now at the inquiry into his death, there were no witnesses that were placed under oath. It was basically just announced that Lowenstein had accidentally walked out of the door, regardless of any test that had been run on that door. Now, again, we have to remember we're dealing with multiple agencies. You have the, you know, the air investigators, I guess, for both um, countries is what you would say. Um, but then also landing on a military base, um, detectives that were based out of a police station. So really just a lot of people in there adding their information and giving their ideas. But when it came down to coming up with a verdict, the investigators supported the cause or idea that he just accidentally walked out the door and they disregarded any testing that was done. And they based their opinion that he just walked out the door because Donald Drew and the mechanic Robert Little said that the door was just very easy to open. So that was a little suspicious. Let's explore some of the theories about his disappearance and subsequent death that are out there. So, you know, we did touch upon an accident, but to explore it a little bit more, um, you know, this was probably the main theory at the time of the accident. According to one newspaper article, Lowenstein had become what they called absent-minded, so their thought was he opened up the wrong door. But as was shown by the testing, the door could not just easily have opened. Now, even if I'm feeling absent-minded, no matter what the situation, if some type of barrier comes in my way, I have a tendency to you know, kind of snap out of it and you know, refocus. So you would have thought that if having to push as hard as he could against this door was stopping him from getting to where he wanted to go, that he would have taken a step back, reassessed things, and then realized he was trying to go out the wrong door. Secondly to that too, the entrance exit door had a window in it, whereas for obvious reasons, the lavatory did not. So that would just kind of add on to a recognition that Al Alfred would have had in you know, seeing that that door was not the actual bathroom door. It was said that at this time, Alfred was suffering from extremely high blood pressure. And that has, or that has shown that people who have extremely high blood pressure can act as, you know, the article said, absent-minded. Someone at um, some point even reported that he almost walked into the propellers of a plane. Now, personally, I feel that's grasping at straws, but looking at, you know, the facts surrounding the case, if he was truly ap acting absent-minded because of a blood pressure situation, that could explain why his valet was so worried about him and that after a very short time, he did decide to go check on Alfred. But then again, I have another thought of if you knew he was really having difficulty, why did you wait so long? So this would be a case where, you know, letting him you know, stay out of your purview of sight for a longer period of time might not have been as prudent, but we don't know. Now, as for the theory that he killed himself, some of the same issues still arise. 
You know, the theories persist that because Lowenstein was going through these financial troubles with his investors, he decided to take his own life. However, many reports say that he was very devoutly Catholic. So committing suicide was out of the question. And, you know, back again to the door, it just could not have been opened in a way that he could, you know, open it and get out and then leave the door flapping in the wind, as the witnesses said. Now, you know, as soon as the door opened, even if Alfred had been able to make it out, it would have snapped shut and would not have been open at all, according to how the tests um, came out. Now, there are around three more different theories that are a little nefarious. I say around three because a couple of these theories have some offshoots. So depending on how you want to look at them, they can be either their own individual theory or just an offshoot of an existing theory. So the first two theories involve murder. Now, the first one is that business rivals arranged for his murder using people within his inner circle to help commit the crime. Now, because both the pilot, Donald Drew, and the mechanic, Robert Little, said that the door was easy to open, they were, of course, suspects, at least to those who were considering this not an accident. And in my thoughts, Baxter would have also had to have been in on it, too, as there was no indication that Little or Drew left the cockpit while Lowenstein was in the back of the plane. Now, if Drew, Little, and Baxter were the henchmen, who was the mastermind then? An author named William Norris wrote a book called The Man Who Fell from the Sky. In that book, he mentions Henri Dreyfus, who was a business rival of Alfred Lowenstein. Now, at some point, Dreyfus had written to a newspaper and submitted what he would consider an expose to the newspaper, and Lowenstein was now suing him for libel. But would this make someone murder another person, especially such a high-profile person, knowing that you would probably be one of the first suspects? Or could there be another possible scenario regarding to a murder theory? Now, this next part of this theory says it could have been two of Lowenstein's business partners. Now, in a lot of arrangements, even today, if there are multiple partners in a business, there is a clause that reads, if one of those partners were to pass away, then the shares or interest in that company would then fall to the other um, business partners. So that did happen in this case. This would mean too that Alfred and his next of kin, I'm sorry, Alfred's next of kin would not inherit anything. Now, also something that's not unusual is there was life insurance for Alfred. Now, what was found is there were actually some anonymous insurance policies, which I'd never heard of before. Those probably wouldn't fly today, no pun intended, because of concerns about money laundering. If there was no clear beneficiary or no information given as to who started the policy, that would be very suspicious, but apparently there were anonymous, anonymous policies back then. And these particular business partners made a $13 million profit after Alfred had disappeared and died. Come to find out, there were also $13 million worth of anonymous life insurance policies. So you know, read into that what you will. That is very interesting that the amounts match. But there were also other people who could have wanted him gone, um, such as those who had investments with him that, you know, the investment had failed. The next theory also involves murder, but for personal gain, not business gain. Um, there was a little bit more information on this. I wouldn't exactly call it evidence, but a theory that his wife arranged for the murder. Now, his wife's name was Madeline, and she did not attend the funeral, and she buried him in an unmarked grave at her family's plot. So the fact that she really did not do a lot for his funeral, that, le that lends credence to those who believe in this theory. 
Um, you know, again, the funeral itself was simple. There's no headstone. And so that's kind of odd for a man as prominent as Alfred Lowenstein to be buried without any type of fanfare. I know this was at the end of the 1920s, but still, this was a pretty important man. Now, some descriptions, including a newspaper that was published in the U.S. after, um, after the Lowensteins had visited New York, they depicted um, Mrs. Lowenstein as being timid. So this leads some people to think that she would not have, you know, basically had the fortitude to hire um, a hitman to have her husband killed. But part of this theory would also include not necessarily hiring someone from the outside, but it would mean hiring people from the inside that would be on the plane, such as Donald Drew, Robert Little, and Fred Baxter. Now, some people did describe their marriage as cold or frosty, so the motive is always looked at as being money. There are others, though, who say that would not have been a motive because Alfred let Madeline spend in whatever way she wanted to. But if he were to die, then any potential earnings that he would have later on may not have necessarily gone to Madeline, depending on what those business clauses were and if those other partners got you know, a lot of money from the life insurance and also gained his shares. So I can see both sides. Um, but she really would not have gained a lot if she had killed him. There were no mentions of affairs or anything like that, so that really could not have been held up as a motive. Madeline also did pay for a private autopsy, so, you know, I find it funny that if she actually did commit the murder or hire people to do so, that she would hire someone to do an autopsy unless he was in on it too. About the only thing that I can see as far as monetary gain would be possibly if she was actually the beneficiary of those anonymous life insurance policies and just by coincidence one of his businesses made that exact same profit or you know if she had just always held these life insurance policies with no thought as to what the other business partners may have been doing. When you make that much money, it's probably not really unheard of to make sure that you have those um, insurance policies so that your loved ones are taken care of. Now the author that I mentioned previously, William Norris, he believes that Lowenstein was thrown from the plane. Now in his book, he did bring up events, at least to me, that don't have any relation to Alfred's disappearance and death. But as this was brought up a couple times in what I saw, um, Lowenstein's son's name was Robert, and he actually shot a member of the household staff. He would later go on to die in a plane accident during World War II, which honestly is a little creepy having a plane involved in his son's death as well. But again, we have to remember, you know, things were not as safe in aviation as they are today. Plus, it was during a world war. Now, Norris's theory about how the issue with the door of the airplane was bypassed is rather detailed. So his theory, um, just to kind of summarize it into relatable terms, was that the door was actually rigged with loosened or missing bolts, making it easy to take the door off and just throw Lowenstein off the plane as well as throwing the door off. It was reported that a fisherman had seen something falling from the sky at, and I quote, precisely the moment that Lowenstein went missing. I find this suspicious because even those who were on board the plane did not know when he had actually fallen. So, you know, to say that someone saw something in the air at the exact moment that Lowenstein died would be a little bit of a far fetch for me. Now to support a theory that other people were involved, some may point to Robert Little. Now for the next few years he lived a pretty extravagant life, um, but he had been diagnosed with cancer so he died shortly after this incident. Baxter also met a premature death. 
He worked for the Lowensteins even after Alfred's death, but four years later, he was found himself dead with a gun in his hand. Now, because there's no other evidence to the contrary, it was ruled a suicide. But many also believe that he had killed himself because of a guilty conscience. Others believe, though, that he, he was killed because someone was afraid that he would say something about the murder. Now, my thoughts on this were about the description saying that he had the gun in his hand, that he was holding the gun. But once, once that gun is fired and you know, you've committed suicide, your muscles will loosen and you really would not be able to hold on to the gun. That's why if you've ever you know, seen any documentaries about a suicide, they really you know, look to see what's under the body if they don't see any other gun around. The theory then being that they dropped the gun and then subsequently fell on top of it. So I don't think he could have been holding it in his hand unless that was something added to embellish the story. Now, the last theory is faking his own death. And there's a lot of different ways we can go off on different branches on this. But, you know, this, there are a few theories within this one that I'll be discussing. So first is there was a body that was found. So did he take some poor man's body with the money that he had. You know, I'm sure he could have found a way to buy one. Um, there was no DNA testing in those days. And, you know, looking at what they would have gone through to identify him, you know, they mentioned he had his clothes on, basically. So anybody could have been dressed in his clothes. It would also then, you know, be able to speak about the alcohol in his system either as it was a different person who drank while um, Alfred did not or there may have been further decomposition which would have created more alcohol in the system as part of that process. To make this work really people would have been or would have had to see Alfred get on the plane so other people at the airstrip would have had to actually see him get on the plane which would then lead to his disappearance. So people did, you know, actually did give statements um, about seeing him. So that was a very important fact if you're looking at a faked death. That would mean somehow Alfred would need to get off of the airplane. Now this is where, you know, the, the um, landing on the beach does come in handy. Now, I didn't see this necessarily mentioned either, but instead of replacing the door, which I think was absolutely, you know, that that was a little too in intricate as well as it would leave a lot up in the air as you, know, you would need to make sure you had enough time to get that door back on before people came to see what was going on. But he could have landed and then snuck off the plane or got off the plane and went to a waiting car or got a disguise, you know, found a way to um, stay off the radar for at least a few days until he got to where he was going. So I find actually walking out of the plane um, once it landed a far easier scenario to, you know, kind of wrap our heads around rather than taking bolts and everything off a door and then trying to replace it before someone comes to your aid. Then with that being said, that would also explain why Drew decided to land on the beach and not an airstrip because again, the beach, you know, it was not a place where you would have people coming out immediately to meet you like you would have at an airstrip. So that gave a few extra moments for Lowenstein to get away. Um, it took about six minutes for anyone to reach the plane after they landed. So to me, that would have been enough time to at least get a tiny bit of distance between himself and the plane. But if he did have a car waiting, then you know, that would have created even more distance once the French military figured out exactly what was going on. Now, an initial thought that I had with this scenario was if you're trying to fake your death 
or I guess even going back to um, committing murder, you know, if you're thinking about you know Baxter or Drew or Little committing this murder, is there would be a lot of investigation and speculation in this case. And if you're trying to, you know, either kill someone or if you're trying to fake your own death, you probably would not want to do it in such a high profile way as to jump off a plane. So I do understand there's some kinks in, you know, the theory of, you know, intentionally faking his death, um, you know, some things that may not actually be answered, but at the same time, to me, it most, most closely matches what we do know of the events of that day. In any of these cases, we would also have to take a look at the moral compasses of those that were on board the plane. In any scenario, I feel that pretty much all of the people on the plane would have had to be privy to what his intentions were. Now, some have posed a theory that this was kind of like um, an Agatha Christie novel, Murder on the Orient, Orient Express. I'm not going to ruin it if you've never read it, but um, if you have, you know what I'm talking about. In any of these scenarios as well, we have to ask ourselves why did no one on the plane seemingly interject to stop him from doing what he was doing. Um, if he did stage his own death, you know, they would basically be losing you know, their meal ticket. They got to travel, they got, I would say, probably handsomely paid and you know they became successful in their careers so to you know lose that meal ticket then you know i i think they would have a hard time just letting him go and also i do believe at least one person would have tried to stop him if it was an actual suicide funeral homes you know, anybody that he did procure would have needed to have no signs of an autopsy or embalming on it. So he could have been looking at someone who appeared to have died of natural causes. And if they had alcohol or anything illicit in their system, that would show up. Hence, as the alcohol did show up on, on Alfred's autopsy. Now, you know, somebody from one of those companies, say, you know, someone who worked at the funeral home, someone who worked at the ME's office, you know, while med student is a small possibility, I think there would be too many signs of um, an autopsy or something like that being done. But once Alfred may have heard back from the person he hired that a body had come in that matched him generally um, and that this person didn't have anybody you know, claiming the body that could have then been bought and his employees informed that his plan was about to go into action. So something that I find hard to believe in any of these scenarios is that everybody on board would have stayed quiet for the, for the rest of their lives. Now, Robert Little did die only a few years after this happened, but people reported that he lived, you know, pretty extravagantly my thoughts on that is if you were bought off or paid a lot of money to you know back up the story of this very rich man going missing then you may not like take the money and use it all at one time however baxter knew his life was coming to, to an end i'm sorry little i should say little knew that his life was coming to an end so he went ahead and you know, spent the money and I think most people would if they were in that situation. So in some ways that itself, the idea of a payoff kind of weaves throughout all of the different um, theories and scenarios for him dying, whether it was suicide, murder, or an accident. So, or murder. I just find it harder to believe that six people could stay quiet about there being a murder. You know, there would be a lot of moral objection to that, um, that you're taking another person's life, and I believe the crew would have tried to stop him. Now, as far as paying off to fake your own suicide, that may have just been something that all parties that were in the plane could have agreed upon. 
if Lowenstein had told them nobody would get hurt. They just needed to follow his plan and they would get a big payoff. And there could have also been, you know, the idea of a threat to the individuals, not necessarily of harm, but that if they spoke out about the um, faked death, that there is a little bit of a divergence on this theory um, that I thought of where it could be a combination of two things. What if Lowenstein planned to kill himself and his wife was in on the plan, but she decided that she would take the opportunity to get rid of a man that you know she was having marital difficulties with or it could be also you know any of his business partners if they had heard about his death um, they could have then afterwards killed him as well so that the body that was found was actually his so in other words it would have been like a double cross that a handful of people knew what he was planning and at least one of those handful of people made it so that he actually did die and not just disappear. In this scenario she also would have had some anonymous life insurance policies that she would cash in making it more of a financial motive than if she didn't have anonymous life insurance policies. If his wife was involved in a murder at all I don't think it would have started out like that. I think it would have started out as a staged um, death and she or again maybe even the business partners could have taken advantage of what they knew of his plan. And just one last thing about a staged death would be the door itself again in that you know, the description that Baxter gave of it flapping in the wind, we know that was not really a possibility. So since they had not tested this and there was not a lot of information known, you know, by the general public about aviation, they may have thought that a door would just kind of go back and forth in the wind like a screen door or a door during a storm. Whereas this was not, you know, necessarily the case. So this is a hole really that you can you know, drive a bus through um, in pretty much every theory. That's the problem is it, it kind of shows up in every theory. And something that I'm just thinking of now as well is when he walked into that cabin, um, he did try the bathroom door. If the floor or the um, entrance exit door was flapping in the wind, wouldn't he have been more concerned about, you know, himself falling out um, you know, without tethering himself somewhere to the plane, he was at a very real risk of falling out if that door just kept flapping. But he definitely knew by trying to gain access to the bathroom that his boss was not in there either. So this is the end of the story of the very strange disappearance of Alfred Lowenstein. You know, to have fallen out of a plane seems implausible, or for even someone to have killed him on a plane and pushed him out seems you know, just as implausible, all due to the door. So, you know, again, with my thoughts, it leads me to the only possible one, even if it seems far-fetched, uh, staging his death. I don't think any of these theories are ones that anybody would think of in you know, in just any given time. But, you know, this was the beginning of aviation, really. And Alfred had the money to make sure that, you know, he had the best in life. If that started to follow him around or cause problems for him, you know, he may have needed to do some nefarious things to you know, try to get back on track. But that could have led to his demise so even though it's been over 90 years, we may never know what actually happened to Alfred Lowenstein. There really is no theory that covers every single question we may have. And there probably never will be. But I'd be interested in knowing your thoughts on this case. So if you do want to leave a comment either on YouTube or um, if your podcast app does allow comments, then that would be greatly appreciated. 
I just found this to be, you know, a completely interesting case because you would never think that someone would either stage their own death by quote unquote falling out of a plane. Falling out of a plane may have made it hard to collect insurance money if the body was never found. But to me, the fact that the body was found lends itself to the whole faking his own death theory because they needed something. They needed to show that he was dead in some way, so they found a lookalike or someone to replace him, if you will. So with all that being said on this particular topic, um, I am thinking for one of my next two episodes to be looking at an event in history that was overshadowed by a much larger catastrophe and the word or description of much larger is kind of an understatement. So I will let everyone know about that once I upload again and I appreciate you tuning in and listening. I hope everybody has a great week. Bye.
side, they really you know, look to see what's under the body if they don't see any other gun around. The theory then being that they dropped the gun and then subsequently fell on top of it. So I don't think he could have been holding it in his hand unless that was something added to embellish the story. Now, the last theory is faking his own death. And there's a lot of different ways we can go off on different branches on this. But, you know, this, there are a few theories within this one that I'll be discussing. So first is there was a body that was found. So did he take some poor man's body with the money that he had? You know, I'm sure he could have found a way to buy one. Um, there was no DNA testing in those days. And, you know, looking at what they would have gone through to identify him, you know, they mentioned he had his clothes on, basically. So anybody could have been dressed in his clothes. It would also then, you know, be able to speak about the alcohol in his system, either as it was a different person who drank while um, Alfred did not, or there may have been further decomposition, which would have created more alcohol in the system as part of that process. To make this work, really people would have been, or would have had to see Alfred get on the plane. So other people at the airstrip would have had to actually see him get on the plane, which would then lead to his disappearance. So people did, you know, actually did give statements um, about seeing him so that was a very important fact if you're looking at a faked death that would mean somehow Alfred would need to get off of the airplane now this is where you know the the um, landing on the beach does come in handy now I didn't see this necessarily mentioned either but instead of replacing the door which I think was absolutely you know, that that was a little too in intricate as well as it would leave a lot up in the air as you, know, you would need to make sure you had enough time to get that door back on before people came to see what was going on. But he could have landed and then snuck off the plane or got off the plane and went to a waiting car or got a disguise, you know, found a way to um, stay off the radar for at least a few days until he got to where he was going. So I find actually walking out of the plane um, once it landed a far easier scenario to you know kind of wrap our heads around rather than taking bolts and everything off a door and then trying to replace it before someone comes to your aid. Then with that being said, that would also explain why Drew decided to land on the beach and not an airstrip because, again, the beach, you know, it was not a place where you would have people coming out immediately to meet you like you would have at an airstrip. So that gave a few extra moments for Lowenstein to get away. Um, it took about six minutes for anyone to reach the plane after they landed, so... To me, that would have been enough time to at least get a tiny bit of distance between himself and the plane. But if he did have a car waiting, then you know, that would have created even more distance once the French military figured out exactly what was going on. Now, an initial thought that I had with this scenario was, if you're trying to fake your death, or I guess even going back to um, committing murder, if you're thinking about, you know, Baxter or Drew or Little committing this murder, is there would be a lot of investigation and speculation in this case. And if you're trying to, you know, either kill someone or if you're trying to fake your own death, you probably would not want to do it in such a high profile way as to jump off a plane. So I do understand there's some kinks in, you know, the theory of you know, intentionally faking his death, um, you know, some things that may not actually be answered, but at the same time, to me, it most, most closely matches what we do know of the events of that day.
In any of these cases, we would also have to take a look at the moral compasses of those that were on board the plane. In any scenario, I feel that pretty much all of the people on the plane would have had to be privy to what his intentions were. Now, some have posed a theory that this was kind of like um, an Agatha Christie novel, Murder on the Orient, Orient Express. I'm not going to ruin it if you've never read it, but um, if you have, you know what I'm talking about. In any of these scenarios as well, we have to ask ourselves why did no one on the plane seemingly interject to stop him from doing what he was doing. Um, if he did stage his own death, you know, they would basically be losing you know, their meal ticket. They got to travel, they got, I would say, probably handsomely paid, and, you know, they became successful in their careers. So to, you know, lose that meal ticket, then, you know, I, I think they would have a hard time just letting him go. And also, I do believe at least one person would have tried to stop him if it was an actual suicide funeral homes, you know, anybody that he did procure would have needed to have no signs of an autopsy or embalming on it. So he could have been looking at someone who appeared to have died of natural causes. And if they had alcohol or anything illicit in their system, that would show up. Hence, as the alcohol did show up on, on Alfred's autopsy. Now, you know, somebody from one of those companies, say, you know, someone who worked at the funeral home, someone who worked at the ME's office, you know, while med student is a small possibility, I think there would be too many signs of um, an autopsy or something like that being done. But once Alfred may have heard back from the person he hired that a body had come in that matched him generally um, and that this person didn't have anybody you know, claiming the body that could have then been bought and his employees informed that his plan was about to go into action. So something that I find hard to believe in any of these scenarios is that everybody on board would have stayed quiet for the, for the rest of their lives. Now, Robert Little did die only a few years after this happened, but people reported that he lived, you know, pretty extravagantly my thoughts on that is if you were bought off or paid a lot of money to you know back up the story of this very rich man going missing then you may not like take the money and use it all at one time however baxter knew his life was coming to, to an end i'm sorry little i should say little knew that his life was coming to an end so he went ahead and you know, spent the money, and I think most people would if they were in that situation. So in some ways, that itself, the idea of a payoff kind of weaves throughout all of the different um, theories and scenarios for him dying, whether it was suicide, murder, or an accident. So, or murder. I just find it harder to believe that six people could stay quiet about there being a murder. You know, there would be a lot of moral objection to that, um, that you're taking another person's life, and I believe the crew would have tried to stop him. Now, as far as paying off to fake your own suicide, that may have just been something that all parties that were in the plane could have agreed upon. If Lowenstein had told them nobody would get hurt, they just needed to follow his plan and they would get a big payoff. And there could have also been, you know, the idea of a threat to the individuals, not necessarily of harm, but that if they spoke out about the um, faked death, that there is a little bit of a divergence on this theory um, that I thought of where it could be a combination of two things. What if Lowenstein planned to kill himself and his wife was in on the plan, but she decided that she would take the opportunity to get rid of a man that 
you know, she was having marital difficulties with. Or it could be also, you know, any of his business partners, if they had heard about his death, um, they could have then afterwards killed him as well, so that the body that was found was actually his. So in other words, it would have been like a double cross that a handful of people knew what he was planning and at least one of those handful of people made it so that he actually did die and not just disappear. In this scenario, she also would have had some anonymous life insurance policies that she would cash in, making it more of a financial motive than if she didn't have anonymous life insurance policies. If his wife was involved in a murder at all, I don't think it would have started out like that. I think it would have started out as a staged um, death and she or again maybe even the business partners could have taken advantage of what they knew of his plan. And just one last thing about a staged death would be the door itself again in that you know, the description that Baxter gave of it flapping in the wind, we know that was not really a possibility. So since they had not tested this and there was not a lot of information known you know, by the general public about aviation, they may have thought that a door would just kind of go back and forth in the wind like a screen door or a door during a storm. Whereas this was not you know, necessarily the case. So this is a hole really that you can you know, drive a bus through um, in pretty much every theory. That's the problem is it, it kind of shows up in every theory. And something that I'm just thinking of now as well is when he walked into that cabin, um, he did try the bathroom door. If the floor or the um, entrance exit door was flapping in the wind, wouldn't he have been more concerned about, you know, himself falling out um, you know, without tethering himself somewhere to the plane, he was at a very real risk of falling out if that door just kept flapping. But he definitely knew by trying to gain access to the bathroom that his boss was not in there either. So this is the end of the story of the very strange disappearance of Alfred Lowenstein. You know, to have fallen out of a plane seems implausible, or for even someone to have killed him on a plane and pushed him out seems you know, just as implausible, all due to the door. So, you know, again, with my thoughts, it leads me to the only possible one, even if it seems far-fetched, uh, staging his death. I don't think any of these theories are ones that anybody would think of in you know, in just any given time. But, you know, this was the beginning of aviation, really. And Alfred had the money to make sure that, you know, he had the best in life. If that started to follow him around or cause problems for him, you know, he may have needed to do some nefarious things to you know, try to get back on track. But that could have led to his demise so even though it's been over 90 years, we may never know what actually happened to Alfred Lowenstein. There really is no theory that covers every single question we may have. And there probably never will be. But I'd be interested in knowing your thoughts on this case. So if you do want to leave a comment either on YouTube or um, if your podcast app does allow comments, then that would be greatly appreciated. I just found this to be you know, a completely interesting case because you would never think that someone would either stage their own death by quote unquote falling out of a plane. Falling out of a plane may have made it hard to collect insurance money if the body was never found. But to me, the fact that the body was found lends itself to the whole faking his own death theory because they needed something. They needed to show that he was dead in some way, so they found a lookalike or someone to replace him, if you will. So with all that being said on this particular topic, 
Um, I am thinking for one of my next two episodes to be looking at an event in history that was overshadowed by a much larger catastrophe. And the word or description of much larger is kind of an understatement. So I will let everyone know about that once I upload again. And I appreciate you tuning in and listening. I hope everybody has a great week. Bye of natural causes and if they had alcohol or anything illicit in their system that would show up hence as the alcohol did show up on on Alfred's autopsy now you know somebody from one of those companies say you know someone who worked at the funeral home someone who worked at the ME's office you know, while med student is a small possibility, I think there would be too many signs of um, an autopsy or something like that being done. But once Alfred may have heard back from the person he hired that a body had come in that matched him generally um, and that this person didn't have anybody, you know, claiming the body, that could have then been bought and his employees informed that his plan was about to go into action. So something that I find hard to believe in any of these scenarios is that everybody on board would have stayed quiet for the, for the rest of their lives. Now, Robert Little did die only a few years after this happened, but people reported that he lived you know, pretty extravagantly. My thoughts on that is if you were bought off or paid a lot of money to you know, back up the story of this very rich man going missing, then you may not like take the money and use it all at one time. However, Baxter knew his life was coming to, to an end. I'm sorry, Little, I should say. Little knew that his life was coming to an end. So he went ahead and you know, spent the money. And I think most people would if they were in that situation. So in some ways, that itself, the idea of a payoff kind of weaves throughout all of the different um, theories and scenarios for him dying whether it was suicide murder or an accident so or murder i just find it harder to believe that six people could stay quiet about there being a murder you know there would be a lot of moral objection to that that you're taking another person's life and I believe the crew would have tried to stop him. Now as far as paying off to fake your own suicide, that may have just been something that all parties that were in the plane could have agreed upon. If Lowenstein had told them nobody would get hurt, they just needed to follow his plan and they would get a big payoff. And there could have also been you know, the idea of a threat to the individuals, not necessarily of harm, but that if they spoke out about the um, faked death, that there is a little bit of a divergence on this theory um, that I thought of where it could be a combination of two things. What if Lowenstein planned to kill himself and his wife was in on the plan but she decided that she would take the opportunity to get rid of a man that you know she was having marital difficulties with or it could be also you know any of his business partners if they had heard about his death um, they could have then afterwards killed him as well so that the body that was found was actually his so in other words it would have been like a double cross that a handful of people knew what he was planning and at least one of those handful of people made it so that he actually did die and not just disappear. In this scenario, she also would have had some anonymous life insurance policies that she would cash in, making it more of a financial motive than if she didn't have anonymous life insurance policies. If his wife was involved in a murder at all, I don't think it would have started out like that. I think it would have started out as a staged um, death and she, or again, maybe even the business partners could have taken advantage of 
what they knew of his plan. And just one last thing about a staged death would be the door itself again, in that you know the description that Baxter gave of it flapping in the wind, we know that was not really a possibility. So since they had not tested this and there was not a lot of information known you know, by the general public about aviation, they may have thought that a door would just kind of go back and forth in the wind like a screen door or a door during a storm. Whereas this was not, you know, necessarily the case. So this is a hole really that you can you know, drive a bus through um, in pretty much every theory. That's the problem is it, it kind of shows up in every theory. And something that I'm just thinking of now as well is when he walked into that cabin, um, he did try the bathroom door if the floor or if the um, entrance exit door was flapping in the wind. Wouldn't he have been more concerned about, you know, himself falling out, um, you know, without tethering himself somewhere to the plane? He was at a very real risk of falling out if that door just kept flapping. But he definitely knew by trying to gain access to the bathroom that his boss was not in there either. So this is the end of the story of the very strange disappearance of Alfred Lowenstein. You know, to have fallen out of a plane seems implausible, or for even someone to have killed him on a plane and pushed him out seems you know, just as implausible all due to the door. So, you know, again, with my thoughts, it leads me to the only possible one, even if it seems far-fetched, as uh, staging is death. I don't think any of these theories are ones that anybody would think of in, you know, a, in just any given time. But, you know, this was the beginning of aviation, really, and Alfred had the money to make sure that you know, he had the best in life if that started to follow him around or cause problems for him you know he may have needed to do some nefarious things to you know, try to get back on track but that could have led to his demise so even though it's been over 90 years we may never know what actually happened to alfred lowenstein there really is no theory that covers every single question we may have and there probably never will be. But I'd be interested in knowing your thoughts on this case. So if you do want to leave a comment either on YouTube or um, if your podcast app does allow comments, then that would be greatly appreciated. I just found this to be you know, a completely interesting case because you would never think that someone would either stage their own death by quote unquote falling out of a plane Falling out of a plane may have made it hard to collect insurance money if the body was never found. But to me, the fact that the body was found lends itself to the whole faking his own death theory because they needed something. They needed to show that he was dead in some way, so they found a lookalike or someone to replace him, if you will. So with all that being said on this particular topic, um, I am thinking for one of my next two episodes to be looking at an event in history that was overshadowed by a much larger catastrophe. And the word or description of much larger is kind of an understatement. So I will let everyone know about that once I upload again. And I appreciate you tuning in and listening. I hope everybody has a great week. Bye.